This week on The Futurist, Peter Glick. The bad news is that human-caused climate change is a reality now. It's a, it's upon us. It's no longer yeah, something that's, that's coming. It's here. Welcome to The Futurists. I'm your host, Brett King, and joining me in the hosting chair this, uh, this day is the lovely Katie King, Miss Metaverse. Welcome back. Ah, happy to be back. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're going to get into water today. Um, I I don't know if you remember the the Bond movie Quantum of Solace in 2008, but the premise was that um, there was this international uh, in group of uh, criminals buying up all the water assets of an unnamed South, you know, Central American country, if I remember correctly, and uh, they thought the the government thought it was about oil rights, but it ended up being about water rights um, because water is going to be the implication was water is going to be incredibly scarce in the future and very valuable. So, we have brought in one of the world's top futurists and uh, scientists and thinkers in respect to uh, water. And the future of water. I, he, he is today the number one best-selling author in environmental hydrology, which I didn't even know was a thing until I read it as a category. Uh, Peter Glick. He's he's also best known. Um, he's well. He's widely known as one of the most uh, cited water experts. He was educated at Yale and Berkeley. Um, winner of the MacArthur Foundation Award. Uh, is elected to the National Academy of Sciences in the U.S. He was awarded the Carl Sagan Prize in 2018. So he's just published his new book, The Three Ages of Water, Prehistoric Past, Imperil Present, and A Hope for the Future. Peter Glick, welcome to The Futurists. Thank you for having me on. It's a delight to be here. Excellent. Um, so, uh, you know, as as far as the issues around water, um, you know, you talk about these three ages – and you've defined it in the subtitle of the book. So the long uh, uh, past history of water, the, uh, the, the current phase we're going through and, and what hope you have for the future. And I want to get into that. But um, how would you describe humans' relationship with water, humanity's relationship with water, and why is it so important for us to get this right sooner rather than later? Well, I think water is such a wonderful topic. It's it's connected to everything we care about. It's connected to human health and environmental health. It's connected to, obviously, the need to grow food. Uh, it's connected to international politics and conflict. It's it's uh, uh, an important part of climate change, which we're now increasingly having to deal with. Uh, so, so water is a critical resource, obviously. People really care about water, but it's also tied up with the with the very origin of the planet, frankly, with the origin of the universe, uh, and with the evolution of Homo sapiens, which which fundamentally revolved around the availability or lack of availability of water. And so water tells us a lot about our own history. It tells us a lot about where we are today, and it gives us some insights into where we're going. And that's why I love I love the topic. And as a um, scientist in the space, obviously, you look not just at sort of quality of water, but you're looking at availability of water. I noticed uh, one of the um, discussions you'd, you'd done on YouTube around the Colorado River, um, and you, you gave a ex- astonishing statistic that we've sold more water rights than are, are available. Um, that says that we really don't understand water very well these days. There, there are all sorts of challenges associated with water. You know, the, the amount of water on Earth is the same today as it was four billion years ago when, when the Earth was formed. But one of the big challenges here is that it's not well distributed around the planet. It's, it's not well distributed in space. It's not well distributed in time. Of course, we have water-rich areas and water-poor areas. We have wet seasons and dry seasons. And one of the characteristics of our water challenge is this issue of water supply. How much water is there in any given place compared to how much water people are demanding in any given place? And the Colorado River is a great example where the demands for water far exceed the reliable supply from nature. You know, nature gives us water every year in the Colorado River. It flows down and there are wet years and dry years, (laughs) increasingly dry years. Um, But the demand for water and the water rights that we've given out to the users in the basin 
really now far exceed the reliable delivery of water by nature. And that's true in California. It's true in parts of India and China. And it's one of the characteristics, this shortage of supply compared to demand uh, that we face. But I mean, we we are facing, um, you know, rising sea levels and we're facing facing floods. So, and as you said, you know, the supply of water, the total supply of water hasn't changed. It just circulates. That's what the whole cycle is, the water cycle is about. But um, how is it that we can have this imbalance where we don't have enough to drink and to farm um, and yet we're melting ice and, you know, more, you know, look at what's happening with the, uh, the sea temperatures and so forth at the moment, you know, it's, it's chaos. So, um, you know, how, how are those two things in parallel possible? Well, so one of the most ironic characteristics is, I think it was Arthur C. Clarke who said that if we didn't happen to live on the dry parts of the planet, we wouldn't call this planet earth. We call it ocean. Uh, you know, 97% of the water on the planet is in the oceans. It's salt water, but it's too salty to drink. It's too salty to use to grow crops. And so part of the big water challenge is, of course, dealing with the much more limited amount of fresh water that's available to us and the bad distribution of that water. You know, in the long run, uh, you know, we could talk maybe a little bit later about desalination. We, we know how to take salt out of out of the ocean water, but it's very expensive. It's energy intensive. It has environmental challenges. And it's not really going to provide the solutions that that those of us who depend on fresh water really need. And that that's uh, you know that's one of the challenges we face. I you know I give a lot of talks on water, and one of the first questions is, well, wouldn't we just solve our water problems if we could if we could really turn to the oceans? And I, I wish it were that simple. And, and uh, you know what's. What's the point in time in which humans basically lost control of this? Where um, was it the industrial revolution? Was it the agricultural revolution? When was it that we started down this path of, you know, not living in harmony with the system in respect to water use? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, You know, in the book, I describe the first stage of water as really the period of time from the beginning of the universe. Uh, when the first molecules of hydrogen and oxygen and ultimately water were created up through really the first empires and the first civilizations on the planet, through the evolution of humanity, the migration of Homo sapiens out of Africa, when our relationship was wa- with water was very simple. You know, we took water where we found it and we dumped our wastes where we, you know, where we were. And it didn't really matter because populations uh, were very small and Life was right. pretty miserable anyway for, you know, people died from diseases and childbirth and, and malnutrition. And it, it was the first empires in Mesopotamia and India and China that began to manipulate the hydrologic cycle for their, for their benefit, for our benefit, to finally grow the food artificially with irrigation that was necessary to support those early ancient empires. But ultimately, in the second age of water, which is, I think, of our our age, the scientific revolution, the cultural revolution, that the engineering revolutions that let us build modern society, that was accompanied by vast increases in population. You know, we went from you know millions to billions of people, and we outgrew our local water supplies, and we started to do things to try and deal with that. We built dams to store water in wet seasons so we could use it during dry seasons and to protect us from floods and and droughts. Uh, We built aqueducts to move water from where we got it to where where we wanted it. And that helped a lot. And that's the second age of water. But things really have started to spiral out of control because of population growth, because of economic growth, because of outstripping local water resources like the Colorado River. And that's helped contribute to the crisis we face today. There's a great quote in the book, um, and it's uh, you, you mentioned you mentioned him in one of your uh, one of the videos I watched, which is why I looked it up. And it said, "Water is the true wealth in a dry land. Without it, land is worthless or nearly so. And if you control water, you control the land that depends on it." So this is uh, John Wesley Powell, I understand. Yeah, it's quoted in Wallace Stegner's wonderful books. Yeah. Right. So um, can I ask you, what did John Wesley Powell know about water that we've forgotten? 
So John Wesley Powell was this amazing person. Uh, I don't know how many in the in the audience might might know this, but he was a Civil War veteran. He lost an arm in the, in the Civil War, and he was an explorer. Much. He was the first white man with a party to go down the Colorado River, which was terra incognito at the time. He right. his party down the Colorado River, not knowing what was ahead of him. And a couple of months later, they came out the other end, most of them, not, not all of them, <laughs> came, came out the other end. And he later became, I think, the head of the very first, the, the very first head of the U.S. Geological Survey. And wow. he, he understood water in the West. He understood, as that quote says, that water was critical in an arid land for economy and for wealth and for survival. Uh, he actually proposed when we carved up the West that we not carve it up with these long, these straight lines. You know, Colorado's a nice square and Utah's got these straight lines. That we not do the borders like that, but we do them by watersheds, that we organize the West by watersheds. And that would have been a brilliant, I mean, it was a brilliant suggestion. It would have been wonderful if we had done that. Uh, but that that was ignored. And his idea that understanding water was key to understanding sustainability in the long run, long run was was revolutionary. If you don't yeah. mind me asking, what are watersheds? So a watershed, very simply, is when, when rain falls on the ground, it runs off into a river. Uh, any molecule that falls in a, in a particular area that runs off into that river is in the watershed. Uh, if, it, okay. if it runs off somewhere else, it's a different watershed. So the Mississippi River watershed collects all of the rainfall that falls in that watershed. It all runs off in the Mississippi River. The Colorado River watershed, same thing. It's the, it's the, it's the river that collects the water that falls. And for the Colorado, it's seven states and Mexico. It's shared by those political entities. And if it had been one watershed the way John Wesley Powell had suggested, the politics would be very different today. Yeah. You know, what's interesting is when you go to Europe, right, uh, you see all these historic places like even Venice, right? And they have all these water wells and they look beautiful, right? And and But the problem is they weren't maintained. They were using these ancient water wells for dumping, I mean, over a century. At what point did humanity seem to psychologically turn into poisoning our own waterways? What was the change? Yeah. So, in fact, as populations grew and our, as industries started to grow, we dumped our wastes into the river. The Thames in England through London was a cesspool and Parliament had to had to. Yeah, they had to wear handkerchiefs with perfume just to attend Parliament. That's, That's right. And then they had to close so down in the summer when it was so hot and so smelly yeah. and cholera was rampant and dysentery and typhoid was rampant because our society grew faster and our ability to dump wastes into the environment grew faster than either our ability to understand what we were doing or our ability to solve those problems. But as those problems got worse, we then turned to science and we learned what caused cholera. There's a wonderful story in the book about a guy named John Snow in the 1850s in London who really figured out that cholera was water related a water related disease and when we figured that out we then started to build the technologies to treat water to clean up our waterways to to turn our rivers from cesspools back into living rivers and we've made great progress in that that's one again one of the positive advances of the second age is the wastewater treatment plants and the science of water related diseases that have helped cure a lot of water related diseases um, and so those are the benefits of the revolutions in the second age of water. But of course, we still haven't solved all those problems. Yeah, yes, I mean, uh, Katie, one more thing about that. I, I, you know, when a very important point in history, um, you're probably too young to remember this, but uh, in, in the late 1960s, the Cuyahoga River caught fire. Uh, the right. river yeah, yeah. It flows through Cleveland into Lake Erie. It caught fire from the industrial wastes that were on it. A and, lake on fire. That's uh, great. And other rivers caught fire. Actually, there's yeah. still other rivers catching fire in India and China. But that raised the awareness of the public. And it led to the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act, major laws in the United States that have helped us roll back some of those disasters of the second age. Wow. It makes me think of the, uh, what was it, the, the recent train derailment that happened? 
uh, in Ohio. That was all over the news. Mm -hmm. That's right. Every now and then we still we still see some of these environmental disasters associated with water. Right. Yeah, uh, but that's the thing is like, you know, what you're talking about, um, that along with the uh, the Earthrise photo from the um, Apollo 8 or Apollo 10 astronauts, I can't remember, um, you know, raised this environmental awareness and, and we created out of that the EPA and, mm-hmm. for, you know, the first time, you, as you said, the Clean Water Act and we had these standards. But you see, you know, constant effort now to sort of weaken these um, standards for for the benefit benefit of commercial organisations that that must frustrate you. I know it frustrates me. Oh, I just, I, absolutely. So I just saw I saw Oppenheimer tonight. Oh, I haven't seen it yet. Uh, I'm yeah, looking, and looking. and uh, it just occurred to me that you know, so so often we we um, make these politically expedient decisions. Um, you know, in the face of um, you know. We're really compromising humanity itself, which I don't sort of really understand the the incentives for that. But uh, I mean, this is a more of a philosophical conversation. But no, but that's a really important point. I mean, the reality is we we have a growing understanding of the environmental threats of the planet and the causes uh, and the long term implications of that, and it comes up against the short term profit motive, the the realization that, okay, we can make money in the short run if we do certain things that are bad for the environment. And if your interest is short we'll run, later. Yeah. If your interest is short run, you don't take that long view. Uh, and that's the that's the the contradiction that we face. And it's one of the greatest barriers to solving these problems that we we really understand today, but we have failed to solve. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this at this point in time, before we uh, take a quick break, Peter, we have what we call the lightning round, which helps people just get to know you a little bit better. And uh, so I'm going to try and uh, customize this for your, uh, your expertise. When was the first time you remembered being exposed to the idea that water was critical or important? I guess yeah, I grew up in, in New York City, uh, which has a wonderful water supply. And I remember as a child, there was an incredibly severe drought. Uh, and for the first time, something that I had always taken for granted, the ability to turn on the tap, uh, was something I couldn't take for granted. And of course, you know, I've been through many more droughts since then, and all of us have experienced that probably in one place or another. But it was probably that, that uh, realization that we were dependent on nature for our water uh, and it wasn't just something it that wasn't magically appeared. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when it comes to water, what technology do you think has most changed uh, the relationship of water to humanity? The toilet, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the toilet, again, another thing we take completely for granted. But yeah. you know, the toilet, the modern toilet was invented in, probably in England you know, many centuries ago. Uh, the, the flush toilet by a guy named John Crapper, and that's where the yeah. name comes from. Sir, Sir John Crapper, I believe. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's had a huge positive and sometimes a negative uh, impact on us. Yeah. And a lot of people today don't have one still. Yes, true. Yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of people talk about the fact that, you know, we, you know, we don't really have ubiquitous electricity and ubiqui- ubiquitous sanitation. Yeah. One of the biggest problems around the world is, is this problem of sanitation. Okay, um, name a, a futurist scientist or entrepreneur that has influenced you and why. So uh, there are a number of people who's, uh, you know, the old classic expression, I stand on the shoulders of those who came before me. Uh, people like Roger Ravel, Steve Schneider, a climate scientist, uh, John Holdren, who was one of my mentors and actually was a science advisor for uh, Barack Obama for eight years. Uh, Malin Falkenmark, a Swedish hydrologist. They're, these are all people who, long before water reached the general public's awareness, uh, understood it to be a, a challenge and something we had to deal with. Now, you mentioned John Wesley Powell, but is there a, another statement or a prediction that, um, you know, a scientist or a a hydrologist or, or someone has made about water that was particularly interesting to you? Well, maybe it's not directly water related, but but again, it's sort of related to the way I thought about my book. Um, you know, Winston Churchill said something like, uh, the farther back we can look, the farther forward we can see. Uh, and the idea that 
understanding history and where we've come from is critical for understanding where we can we can look to the future and where we can go in the future. Um, I'm also a huge fan of science fiction. I love science fiction and and uh, a lot right. of well, the classic then, authors. <laughs> then this is a great way to ask the last question. Then, um, when it comes to science fiction. Is there a science fiction story that is representative of the future you hope for? Wow, you know, so much of science fiction is dystopian. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, you know, the Foundation series by Asimov had a, a, a both a dystopian, an incredibly dystopian uh, point of view, but also a hope for reorganizing the humanity into a more positive future. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I've, I love all of those books. All right. Now we had David. We've had David Brin on a, a couple of times, and and David, yeah. uh, he uh, he says that it's because dystopian dystopian TV series are cheaper to make than utopian. <laughs> so that's his theory. But anyway, yeah, I love David Brin stuff, and Kim Stanley Robinson's written a lot about war. Yes, and- well, we have Kim uh, coming on the show this season. Uh, yeah. Fingers crossed. He's on on uh, vacation holiday right now, but hopefully in September we're going to air his episode. Um, uh, some consider him one of the greatest living science fiction authors, and uh, particularly his his work on climate and well, the Mars know, series and his new books on are, climate and series, yeah, man, it's my favorite trilogy. Yeah. yeah. Um, Anyway, let's have a quick break. You're listening to The Futurists. Our guest is Dr. Peter Glick, um, one of the most widely known and cited experts on water or hydrology. And uh, we'll be right back after this break. Provoke Media is proud to sponsor, produce, and support The Futurist podcast. Provoke.fm is a global podcast network and content creation company with the world's leading fintech podcast and radio show, Breaking Banks. And of course, it's spin-off podcasts, Breaking Banks Europe, Breaking Banks Asia Pacific, and the Fintech Five. But we also produce the official Finnovate podcast, Tech on Reg, Emerge Everywhere, the podcast of the Financial Health Network, and Next Gen Banker. For information about all our podcasts, go to provoke.fm or check out Breaking Banks, the world's number one fintech podcast and radio show. Welcome back to The Futurist. Today we have on Dr. Peter Glick, and we are talking about the present, future, and past of water. Not in that order. <laughs> All right. So I want to talk about what is going on with climate change and water today. Because, for example, you know, we travel, uh, and it doesn't matter where you go to, it seems like every place on the planet is being impacted water wise. Uh, what are your thoughts about how this is taking shape now? And are there certain areas in the world that have more concern than others? Well, that's a, a wonderful question. It's a huge question, of course. <laughs> uh, you know, the bad news is that human-caused climate change is a reality now. It's, uh, it's upon us. It's no longer yeah, something that's, that's coming. It's here. Uh, and some of the worst impacts of climate change are going to be on water resources. You know, we have an expression that if climate change is a shark, water resources are the teeth. Uh, and that's what's going to bite us. And that's because the hydrologic cycle, which, of course, you remember from second grade of evaporation and the formation of clouds and condensation and rainfall back to the, the ground into the oceans and runoff again. The hydrologic cycle is the climate cycle. And as the planet warms, we get more evaporation. We get more water in the atmosphere. There's more energy in the atmosphere. We're already seeing more extreme events because of that, both floods and droughts. Sea levels going up, which is a water problem as well. You know, water and climate are just close, so closely connected. And it's also true that our energy system and our water systems are really tied together. It takes a lot of energy to produce and use the water that we want. That contributes to greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, water, energy, climate, food, they're all closely connected and they're, they're increasingly a challenge. In terms of regions... Uh, I would say there's no region on the planet that's invulnerable now to the coming consequences of climate change. Wet areas are getting wetter. That's not what we want. Dry areas are getting drier. (laughs) That's not what we want. Uh, And so uh, uh, everybody needs to be aware of this. I know the just in the news recently, there's talking about how the Euphrates River has been drying up in ways that uh, 
have some people concerned, let's just say. Uh, and I remember even back maybe 20 years ago. I mean, it, I mean uh, the fact that it's mentioned in Revelation as, as part of the <laughs> end times, yeah. <laughs> yeah, something like that, you something know? Like that. Um, <laughs> no, that's yeah, right. But, the, the, the news, you know, the, there are incredible floods going on all the time now and droughts everywhere. Yeah. The Euphrates River is a great example. The Tigris and the Euphrates, the, ancient, the great ancient rivers of ancient Mesopotamia. Uh, where Babylon and Assyria and Sumeria were, where the first water war was, now modern Turkey, Syria, and Iraq, uh, is drying up. It's always been a hot area, but again, another another river where we use more water than nature provides. Yes, and I remember, uh, maybe it was maybe mid-2000s, I recall seeing news that the Bush family bought all this land in Paraguay. And what people don't realize is that Paraguay, uh, as far as I know, is one of the largest freshwater sources in the world. So people have known, you know, especially those with a heavy investment in both uh, government and, uh, you know, society, have known that this is a coming problem. I mean, it's quite the investment to have bought all that land in such a freshwater resource, you know, capital of the world, so to speak. So uh, obviously there's some foresight into all these changes that were coming. Yeah, that's a, that's a good example. And another example that's been in the news lately is Saudi Arabia has bought up a lot of land in Arizona and they're using non-renewable water resources in Arizona, groundwater resources in Arizona to grow alfalfa that they then, for, for cows, but they then ship back to Saudi Arabia. So basically, they're mining water in an yeah. already water scarce area of the United States, so they can feed their cows back in Saudi Arabia. Because of course, there's not enough water to grow alfalfa in Saudi Arabia. It's a, another good example of sort of the internationalization of some of these water challenges. Wow. Right. So, what can we do now to turn this around <laughs> so we don't have? other countries coming and, and yeah, stripping pieces like, of the resources. Sounds like a global policy issue, Peter. You know, I mean, it's not just, a, yeah, I mean, there's individual water rights and, and, and negotiations and things, but this, this needs to be just like all of the stuff around climate needs to be managed at a global level, doesn't it? Well, so, you know, it's mixed. Um, you know, some of our water challenges are global, like those associated with climate change that have to be addressed at the global level. Uh, many of our water challenges are really local. Uh, you know, we have local water districts, we have small watersheds, we have um, uh, local communities that manage their own water. So, uh, you know, the Saudi Arabia problem in, in Arizona, that's a problem for Arizona to figure out. They've got to make a decision about if they're willing to give up long-term availability of their own water resources to grow alfalfa for Saudi Arabia. Um, mm -hmm. Arizona can decide that. The Colorado River which we've talked about, you know, it's shared by seven states. So that, that's got to be dealt with sort of in a little more cooperative level. Uh, but there are some global issues that, that have to be addressed as well. So it's a, it's a multi-scale problem. But isn't it just um, that posture of sustainability, you know, that John Wesley Powell talked about, the fact that we, we need to live in harmony with the water we've got and we need to be cognizant of what available resources we, ha we have. You, you have a, a term, is it water use efficiency that you talk about? Um, yeah. it, it sort of in terms of resource efficiency, you know, when we're talking, you know, um, about foods, the growing uh, or emerging food scarcity problem, um, you know, as a result of sea level rise and, you know, water availability and, and, um, you know, changing farming, uh, habits and, and so forth. Um, you know, you put all this together and how do we develop that culture of, of water use efficiency? Yeah, so in my book, in the third age of water, I do talk about where we have to go to get to a positive, sustainable future for water. And my belief that we can go there, that, that actually we can achieve this positive vision. But in the second age of water, the way we thought about solving our water problems was building supply. Populations were growing, economies were growing. The idea was we always just had to find more water. Uh, whatever the population was going to be, we could move to dry areas, we would build another aqueduct, we'd build another dam, we'd drill another groundwater well. It was always focused on supply. But again, as we've already talked about, we're running up against our limits of supply. Yeah, yeah. And another way to think about this, a, a positive solution 
is thinking about water demand. What do we actually want? We want clean clothes and dishes. We want to grow food. Uh, we want to make semiconductors and other industrial goods and services. We want to do things that take water. But almost everything that we do today with water, we can do with less water than we're right. spending to do them. And that's the concept of demand management, water use efficiency, grow more food with less water, with better irrigation systems and smart controllers and soil moisture monitors. <laughs> we, we talked about toilets. Do what we want with toilets, but with toilets that are much more efficient, washing machines and dishwashers that do what we want with much less water. And we're doing that now. Technology is improving. We're improving water use efficiency. Interestingly, demand for water is actually going down in the United States, not up for the first time in history, which almost nobody knows. It's oh. an indication that this idea of water use efficiency is both important and actually already beginning to happen. Well, California has had to manage their water use now for many years. Mm -hmm. I was yeah, on a no, flight. In the Western U.S. in general, yeah. we're much more aware of, of these issues because water is much scarcer here than in, in the East, which is more humid. Uh, and so a lot of the improvements in water technologies, a lot of the improvements in water policies and water laws have come out of the West, John Wesley Powell's West, where we've had to deal with these problems for a long time. You're in Berkeley, right? Yeah, that's right. I um, So... Um... If you, if we look at California as a model, it's sort of come out of necessity, um, you know, as a result of of the droughts. And and you you've talked about water supply issues, you've talked about um, agricultural issues, but I mean, how bad does it have to get before we sort of reach consensus on this? Oh, or are we close to that now? Yeah, that, that's that's a tough question. Uh, you know, it would be wonderful if uh, if we could see things coming and act on them before they get here. Yeah. But, but that's hum nature. humanity's not really very good at that. We we yeah. tend to be reactive, not proactive. We tend to look at look at our twiddle our thumbs until the crises strike. Uh, a lot of the advances I mean, in water have come only because of disasters, because of floods, yes. because of droughts. Uh, I, I wish we were a little I wish we were a little better at that. I mean, I do want to get into the geoengineering aspects and, and some of the technologies we can rely on to get us out of this uh, situation. But I did note recently that you've opted out of Twitter because you were having challenges with, with the crowd. And this is sort of, you know, fairly clear evidence of the fact that we've still got work to do um, in respect to educating people about the problems that water and food scarcity are going to present for humanity in the future. Um, and I know, you know, when you talk with your colleagues about this, um, you know, other professionals in the space, are you guys optimistic as a group? No. <laughs> yeah. In general, no. Uh, so I'm a scientist by training. I, I, I think science communication is critically important. I love to talk, as perhaps you can tell, about these issues. Um, well, you got a, you got the Carl Sagan Prize for it, dude. So don't, I, you know, don't be modest. I, I loved what was Twitter, uh, which is now just a cesspool of of horrible things. Um, and I try not to spend any time there. So you know, social media is really important to us uh, in different ways for different communities, for communications, for education. Um, but there are a lot of channels for communications and education. I think we need to take advantage of all of them. Um, in general, my community, a science, climate, water community, is not an optimistic community. Um, you know, there's plenty of doom and gloom out there, but I'm an optimist. Uh, and the three ages of water that I wrote, that book, the third age, is a positive vision for the future because right. I truly believe we can solve these water problems. I look around me and see the successful examples of how to do more with water, uh, how to clean up water, how to restore our rivers, how to how to do the things we want to do. And the challenge is doing them faster and doing them more widely. Um, but it's not going to require any magic new technology. It's not going to require more money than we have. We have plenty of money to solve these problems. It's going to require education and communications and a change in will. Absolutely. Right. You know, I know that they're building uh, currently in New Jersey a giant vertical farming facility 
that is, I believe, 30,000 square feet. And uh, it's a step in the right direction, I, I believe, for sure. Uh, do you see more facilities like this being built in the future? Yeah, I think there's a, I think there's a small window for that kind of thing. Um, those tend to be very water efficient because they can collect and recycle all the water they use, a lot of the water they use. Uh, they're, they're not so energy efficient. They're pretty energy intensive. Uh, they're probably okay for really high valued crops like um, some of the vegetables, some of the lettuces, maybe some of the fruits that that we could provide locally. But eighty percent of the, 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 world, the world uses worldwide yeah. is, is is for agriculture, and that kind of vertical farming has sort of a niche a niche role to play. Uh, but we have to be better worldwide in general at growing well, you said, with less you water. You said we have the tech. So what what is the emerging tech that you're bullish on? You know, because you said you're optimistic in the long run by twenty the twenty one hundreds we got this sorted out. So what's the tech you see emerging? I know I know there's got to be a cultural shift in terms of sustainability, but you know what are some of the technol technological aspects that you're, yeah. you're bullish? Well, well, let me make it clear right up front that I think technology is just one piece of this. There have to be changes in water laws. There have to be changes in right. in diets. The things we choose to eat. Because meat and meat diets are very water intensive compared to to, to vegetable diets. Um, but from a technology point of view, if you think about the things that we do with water and the desire to do more of them with less water, you think about drip irrigation rather than flood irrigation that permits farmers to put water exactly where they want it, exactly when they need it, and soil moisture sensors that tell farmers this part of the field doesn't need irrigation. This part of the field does. I, I know farmers now in California who sit in their office at home and they can direct water at any time to different parts of their field. And they're using they're using drones to, to drones, yeah. soil moisture. Um, and that's an improvement for agriculture. You know, the toilets today use a tiny fraction of the water that the toilets used 30 years ago. And frankly, the ones today are much more effective. Washing machines and dishwashers, they seem like mundane pieces of technology, but they do what we want. And if we can do what we want with less water, that's important. Um, but there are all sorts of sensors that that detect water quality problems and let us improve water quality uh, over time. There's water recycling technology that lets us turn polluted water into clean water of any quality we want now. And water recycling is a, an incredibly important step forward for the future. Uh, those are, and ultimately, I guess desalination is one of those technologies that that we will look to as well. I remember, uh, you know, just recently, right? Uh, I noticed more and more people are breaking out of the habit of water bottles. Now, I know you wrote the book, "Bottled and Sold," which, by the way, is an amazing title uh, pertinent to this this topic. What are your thoughts about this, uh, where we're at with the whole bottled water phenomenon? And do you think that this will, the perspective on this will change in the near future? Oh, the whole bottled water story is a bizarre, amazing story, especially in a world where billions of people still don't have access to safe water and sanitation. And yet we're bottling public water supplies and turning it into a private good and selling it for a huge cost. You know, the bottled water industry has been very successful at selling fear of tap water. They're very good at selling convenience. They're very good at selling sex and health, which, you know, they, they print this bottled water brand will make you sexier or healthier than, than something else. You know, think about Jennifer. Uh, what was the brand that makes you sexier? Just, yeah. Jennifer, just... Think about Jennifer Aston's, uh, well, what's her bottled water brand? Anyway, you, you, you... Oh, smart water, smart yeah, water. Yeah. Um, yeah. but the, you know, the truth is that it, it's a temper. I hope it's a temporary phenomenon and gets relegated to emergency situations. You know, you're on the road, you have to have water and there isn't water available, you can buy it. I, I've never argued for banning bottled water, but but I think we should, we should uh, use a lot less of it. And part of that means improving our tap water system so people trust them, so that they're yes. reliable, so that they're modern. We have to invest more in the public water supplies that that we have failed to invest in and that the bottled water companies you know, they take advantage of that. So one of the things I've noticed is that in airports, they're installing uh, public water bottle uh, refill stations, right. which I think yep. is just awesome to see because 
imagine how many people just have to throw out their water bottles just going through airport security. It's such I a waste. It over time. Yeah, so that's another good example <laughs> of sort of the advances we're making. There's a growing awareness of the flaws and the challenges and the, the bad parts of the bottled water industry. More and more people are carrying refillable bottles. And because more people are carrying refillable bottles, the industries are responding and they're they've they're starting to build water fountains that cater to refillable bottles now. Uh, modern water fountains, more public access to water. That, that's a good news story. We were in Paris earlier, and of course, they have tremendous uh, public water sources in Paris. But I yeah. want to get a bit sci-fi, Peter. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, talk, talk to me about 2100 or, you know, maybe 2050. You know, what what is the world of water going to be like in you know, 30 years and then, you know, at the end of the century? Well, so obviously we could have a dystopian vision or we could have a positive vision. And in the book, my third age of water is a positive vision. I talk about what the world is like in 2099. We've solved the water and sanitation and we've finally provided safe water and sanitation for everyone on the planet. We're starting, uh, uh, we've made enormous progress at restoring rivers and restoring the ecosystems that have suffered from our withdrawals of water and our contamination of water. We're, we've reduced the risk of conflicts over water shared by, by nations by putting in place treaties so countries know how to share water and international organizations that reduce the risks of violence over water. We're growing more food with much less water because of improvements in agricultural technologies and crop types. Um, uh, we've uh, started to address the climate problem. We're building resilience of our climate, uh, of our communities to climate change. We're less vulnerable to the disruptions that climate change has caused, and we're reducing greenhouse gas emissions and getting the climate challenge under control. This is the positive vision I talk about in the book, and it's a vision that's accessible, achievable, uh, with no changes in technology, uh, with no massive expenditures of money. It's something we, we can really, a future we can move toward. What did you think about Kim Stanley Robinson's idea to um, attach rockets to comets in the asteroid belt and fly them into the Martian atmosphere to thicken the, uh, the Martian atmosphere in the Mars trilogy? Well, we do know that there's water on Mars, uh, but not very much. And we do know that there's a lot of water in the outer reaches of, this, of the solar system. And of course, there are plenty of great science fiction stories now about well, you need water to colonize the solar system, right? You need water, and uh, mm. we're going to have to find out. You know, if you're not on Earth where there is plenty of water, if we use it properly, uh, if we want to expand out into the universe, we're going to have to figure out how to be careful with our water supplies and how to find the water that we need. Interesting. Well, Peter, where can people find the three ages of water? Well, of course, your, your local independent bookstore is the best place to find any books. Uh, it's available on audiobook. It's you know anywhere anywhere you buy books. Uh, the Three Ages of Water should be available. Did you narrate it yourself? Pardon? Did oh, you narrate no. the audiobook uh, yourself? No, I thought about that. I would have liked to have, but uh, you know there are people who do that far better. Uh, maybe, maybe next time. Yeah, I've not done one of mine yet, but I'm thinking about doing it for one of them. So, um, well, Peter, it's been it's been fantastic to have you on. Um, Water is a precious resource. We are grateful for the work you're doing in raising awareness of how uh, water needs to be treated as, a, as one of our most precious resources. And uh, if you had one message for our audience uh, in terms of how we can help, what would it be? I guess the most important thing is to understand uh, where you get your water, how to protect it, uh, to, to do what you can in your local communities to protect it. And understand that the future could be a positive one, that, that we have solutions to our water problems. And uh, we just need to work in our communities and with our politicians and with our educators to move in that direction. Peter Glick, thanks for joining us on The Futurist. Brett, Katie, thanks very much for having me. That's it for The Futurist this week. Thanks, Katie, for joining. My pleasure. Um, we will have another episode of The Futurists, of course, next week. But in the meantime, if you like the show, 
Um, make sure you uh, go out and check out Peter's book, um, The Three Ages of Water. But also, um, you know, don't forget to uh, tweet us out, um, you know, leave some comments, uh, leave a review of the show. All of that helps other people find the content and uh, leads to uh, the growth, we've incredible growth we've seen in our, uh, the success of the podcast. And then, of course, that leads to sustainability through sponsorship and so forth. So we appreciate your ongoing support. That's it this week for The Futurists. We'll be back next week and we'll see you in the in future. In the future. Well, that's it for The Futurists this week. If you like the show, we sure hope you did. Please subscribe and share it with the people in your community. And don't forget to leave us a five-star review. That really helps other people find the show. And you can ping us anytime on Instagram and Twitter at, at Futurist Podcast for the folks that you'd like to see on the show or the questions that you'd like us to ask. Thanks for joining. And as always, we'll see you in the future.